So we'll talk about the environment, which might seem to be a rather obvious jumping on a uh, familiar global bandwagon, uh, but one which immediately raises some, um, I guess, the questions. If we're going to reconfigure this out of the current Western uh, materialistic paradigm into the uh, Quranic, what he reveals, uh, the fitri landscape of the cabaret, what do we mean by environment? We're going to look at the field terminology. Immediately obvious, you might think, because the modern Arabic word for environment, biya, is the modern Arabic word. If you went back in time, the time machine, back to the time of Memo Ghazali or Bakr ibn Razi, and you start talking about biya, his conception of environment is not that. Uh, I quite like the modern Turkish word, cevre, which really means that which is around us, our surroundings, and I guess it comes from a process of translation from word environment, that which is around us. Uh, so I'm going to speak on that basis. But if we're going to use, again, our vocabulary, maybe we could say this is approximately the meaning of the Arabic root al-Ihata and the divine name al-Muhid. So often we struggle to translate the 99 beautiful names. Al-Muhid, what do we mean? It's in the Quran. But al muhid the one who surrounds, the one who encompasses. Does it really sound good in English? The encompasser with a capital E. Uh, maybe the environment with a capital E. But not referring to the material world, but referring to everything uh, that is that exists, that has being. And muhid which surrounds. This would work particularly well in the context of the Quranic worldview which does a rather strange thing with the natural world. Remember, the Qur'an emerges in the context of an essentially magic or occult-based tribal paganism, where a system of sacrifices existed to ward off certain scary consequences of not making sacrifices to various tribal deities, and where nature seemed to be connected to many of those tribal deities, and there was a superstitious belief that there were jinn and fairies and hippies in certain trees or rocks. It was an animistic, shamanistic kind of culture, and actually one based very much on fear. Not really much sense of mercy or of love, but the deities of the pagan Arab pantheon were overwhelmingly vengeful, and we even have some examples of ancient Arabian idols in our Petulian Museum in Cambridge, and they're designed to scare you, you know, big eyes, and aggressive gestures, and they are not consoling figures. So you might think the Quran comes in that world and would then try to point everybody upwards, away from nature, towards the Empyrean, and say, Laysa Kamithi shape, nothing resembles him, and have nothing to do with the world of nature and regard it as a kind of dark principle in which these fairies and sprites and physical representations of, of divine principles have their being. And some forms of Christianity had done that, not because it's really there in the Gospels, but because of certain late Greek Hellenistic mystery religions which were very dualistic. In other words, the body and nature were forces of darkness. <coughs> you had to liberate yourself from that upwards into the realm of light, dualistic or Manichaean system. Islam never did that. And one of the great paradoxes, maybe the ongoing mysteries of the Holy Quran, from I suppose a historian's viewpoint, is that it valorizes nature, or we might say that which is represented by the name al muhid in a very, very striking uh, and extraordinary way. We have in England, despite everything, about publicity, disorganized communities, a steady stream of people, educated people, who come into Islam from a wide variety of religious backgrounds. In our office at my little college, we've had people who have come to Islam from Jewish ancestry, from Hindu ancestry, from Sikh ancestry. It's part of the strange paradox of modern Islam that we have this stream of people coming in. And they come from various angles, but one thing that appeals to them when they read the Quran is its endless evocations of the natural world. All Muslims often somehow don't spot that or they take it for granted. 
But it's huge. In the Fihak Samawati wa Ardi wa Tilaf in Nayli wa Nahari la Ayati bi Uli al Fab. In the way the heavens and the earth are created and the succession of night and day are signs for people of insight, for people of reflection. And the Yat Kurun of Ra, Yaman wa Kurunan wa Allah to Nubi him where to Fakaruna Fi Hak is Samawati wa Ard. Those who remember God standing and sitting and on their sides and think about the way the heavens and the earth are created. Subhanak ma khalaqta hadha batila. Glory be to you, transcendent are you. The natural world is being contemplated and our response is subhanallah, high above anything. Uh, you have not created this in vain. So this language of ayat is absolutely the foundation of our theology. We look around ourselves and we see not just things, but things that are pointing somewhere. And in fact, in their myriad ways, all pointing in the same direction, namely towards al muhit towards the one who is the ground of the being of the environment. So on the one hand, the Qur'an is polemicizing against these dark mystery religions with their scary deities in favor of Ar-Rahman, who is beyond all comparison. But on the other hand, it does this surprising thing by really valorizing the natural world again and again and saying, Contemplate these things. You'll not see any disorder, any asymmetry, any chaos in the creation of Ar-Rahman, the All-Merciful. And Surah Ar-Rahman, those beautiful evocations, one of the most popular surahs of the Quran. Again and again, we find in the Meccan period, in the Medinan period, this insistence that we recenter ourselves and focus on the sacred and contemplate this tradition of uh, tafakkur, reflection, contemplation, meditation, by pondering the symmetries and the beauty of the creative world, an mm-hmm. aesthetic kind of argument. And of course, it un- underpins the art of Islamic civilization, which is based on bringing to the surface of things the underlying order, which is of divine origin. So, uh, arabesques, tessellations, geometric patterns, which remind somebody in a mosque or looking at a carpet or a textile or a piece of ceramic, that when you look at the surface of things, the miracle is there, because the surface of things is only possible because of underlying physical laws, which Islamic art brings to the surface to remind us of the symmetry of everything, from an atom to a snowflake to a tree. It's, there's no tafawut, there's no disorder in all of this. So he is transcendent, but the world is absolutely sacred. And then we find, and some of these hadiths give us pause, a whole range of sayings and actions of the Blessed Prophet where he engages with the physical world, and particularly with the animal kingdom. And sometimes these are stories that we tell to our children, that uh, the man who took the baby birds out of the nest was condemned, or put the baby birds back into the nest, and the famous hadith where the Holy Prophet is walking through Medina, and there's a crowd gathering, and a commotion. And he says, what's happening? And they say, this man's camel has gone mad. And the camel is in an enclosure. The camel is a big, dangerous creature, and it's foaming at the mouth, and uh, they're afraid to go in to try and calm it down. And the Holy Prophet, alayhi goes into the enclosure, and looks at the animal, and puts his blessed hand on the cam- camel's head, and looks at it, and the animal is still. And then Hadith, he turns around and says, this animal tells me that it has been overworked and overburdened. And the owner of the camel hears about this, bursts into tears, comes to the Holy Prophet, and for those of the camel's, camel's life, it's kind of experiencing a five-star camel lifestyle with nothing to carry and its own fodder every day and looked after. Of course, so many of these Hadiths about responsibility to animals, you know, the story of the woman who has forgiven her sins because she came to a well and there was a thirsty dog and she gave the dog something to drink. Major sins wiped out by kindness to animals in the animal kingdom. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hadiths like this. That's something for the ancient world, which is a little bit surprising. You don't find that in the New Testament anywhere. There are lots of Christians who write about creation, care, and Christianity, but they can't find proof texts in the New Testament. They say the story of the Gadarene swine, which they find embarrassing, which Sayyidina Isa Islam, casts out unclean spirits into the souls of a herd of pigs that then rushes over a cliff. 
and there isn't anything like that in the sira or in the sunnah. Instead, care for creation and these hadith of the camel, but there's other hadith as well. There seems to be some sort of communication. Now you could say, well, the Holy Prophet is just intuiting with his delight of prophecy that this camel has been abused and therefore it's misbehaving. Fine. A secular explanation, if you like. But then you go to the Quran itself that says all kinds of strange things about the created world. Uh, the famous verse about Sayyidina Dawood, for instance, the Prophet David. We placed at the disposal of David the mountains and the birds giving praise. So David and the mountains and the birds are giving praise. How does the mountain give praise? Did you have to have a niyyah? Doesn't have to be a consciousness. What could that mean? Well, the ulama, for instance, Ibn Juzay in his tafsir, think about this. Does something solid like a mountain have ten years? Can it discern? What sort of tasbih does a mountain give? Ibn Juzay says, well, there's literalists who says that's what it says, therefore Allah creates what he calls an idrak, a perception in the mountain at that time, so that it gives praise says. That's how we must interpret it. But others who prefer a metaphorical interpretation, Tariq and Majaz, say if Allah, if, if the mountain was capable of thinking, then it would be giving praise. That's rather speculative because it's simply not what the text says. And other verses about the birds giving praise, and every animal that crawls upon the earth gives praise. What does this mean? Well, Imam al Nawawi has an interesting discussion where he's talking about Mount, the Mount Uhud. And the Prophet says, Uhudun Jabalun Yuhibbuna wa Nuhibbu. Uhud is a mountain that loves us and which we love. Now, if you've been to the Holy Cities, and also to the Third Holy City, which is the Mount of Olives, is also a very spiritually magnetic place, you will have some kind of sense of the the maj majestic presence of those mountains, Jabal and Dur, Thabir, uh, Jabal Ohud, and the Mount of Olives, Jabal al Zaytun. Uh, there is something there, and a friend of mine has the good fortune to live in Medina, and in the evening he likes to sit outside in his garden with his guests, and there's Mount Ohud in the background, and it's kind of glowing, and I've never seen that with any other mountain in the world. It just you can see the whole thing it's a kind of glow and he says oh, for the people of Medina who have always lived here this is a sign of the specialness of the mountain Allahu Akbar it's a bit like the uh, native Australians reverence for, for Mount Uluru Ayers Rock which is as anybody even most half-dead and atheist goes there feels this is something spiritual that sounds a bit primitive animistic there's some kind of spirit in the mountain. It's not that. There is a presence, has something to do with the unseen world that we can't really configure in our minds. But there's a presence there. So what does it mean? Imam Nawawi says, how can the Holy Prophet be loved by Mount Ohud? The Holy Prophet is saying this. He loves the mountain, the mountain loves him. It's because Allah has created a tamiz. He doesn't say idrak, he says a tamiz in that mountain so that it is capable of loving that within Allah's power to do this. The hadith, well in hadith, the Holy Prophet والسلام, is walking on Mount Thabir outside Mecca. He used to love going on hikes, you might say, nowadays, instructed as he walked. Uh, and he's with those who become the first three Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman. And he's discussing God. He's talking about the divine majesty, the holiness of the divine. And the mountain starts to shake until pebbles, Taharak and Hassan, pebbles start rolling down the mountain like an earthquake. The Holy Prophet stamps his foot and says, Askin Tabir, Fama alayka illa nabiyyun wa siddiqun wa shahidan. Be calm, Tabir, for there is nothing on you, there's nobody on you except a prophet and a siddiq and two martyrs. This is, of course, 
prophetic miracle, a prophecy of the future in many ways. But again, it's another of these things that make us, in our strictly monotheistic context, laser committee in shape, uneasy and puzzled. But the point is not to try and theologize this until you get to the, the essence of it. What does it really mean for the birds to give praise? Is it just a poetic way of saying that they're singing, but it's not really praise? Or does God mean what he says? That Ibn Jubei says the Olama have taken different opinions. This is not an animistic view, but it is something that indicates that in nature, which is made up of indications of the divine nature, there is something of al muhit This is a kind of mystical, intuitive, pirasa type insight. You couldn't pin it down in formal doctrine. You might write a nice poem about it, but to try and say in Aqidah terms exactly what this is probably shouldn't us, and probably shouldn't be attempted. But we know that there is a real sacrality in the physical world because the Holy Prophet is engaging with it and engaging with it and teaching people to engage with it. They ask him, a messenger of Allah, shall we be rewarded for kindnesses done to animals? And he says, you'll be rewarded for some any good thing you do to anything that has a wet liver. And the Olama, you can imagine, has a really great time with this. Uh, does that mean I can step on a cockroach? What about scorpions and worms and fish? Anyway, the point is, anything that is a kind of higher form of life that maybe has a brain uh, has hukuk, has rights in Sharia. And the books of Fiqh do recognize that animals have rights. This is a modern idea. Animal rights, a kind of fashionable new age thing, but it's certainly there in the Sharia. You can't just, in Islamic law, harm an animal the way the pagan Arabs used to do, um, brand it and cut its lips and these practices which are prohibited. Beforehand. Or the ancient Arabian practice of if you're in the desert and feeling hungry and thirsty, you just take out your knife and you make a cut in the flank of your camel and you drink some of its blood and then you staunch it up with mud. This was one of the Jahili practices. All of these things are forbidden. So, kindness to animals, a reverence for the signs of the natural world, and also in this slightly uncomfortable sense, the sense that the natural world is somehow part of the organic world. How that works, Allah Alam. It's from the world of dreams, the world of the imagination, the world of the malakot, who knows? Maybe it doesn't matter. It's like the world of the jinn, other things that do not concern us, we need to know nothing about them. But the point is, there is this reverence that the believer is one of those who walks gently upon the earth. The ibad of Rahman, yamshuna al ihauna. The slaves of the all compassionate God are those who walk gently upon the earth. And when the ignorant address them, they say, Peace. This is the first of all of those beautiful characterizations of the slaves of the All-Merciful in the, this long list, famous list. So to be a slave of the All-Merciful, walk gently on the earth. Now this is uncontroversial. And throughout our history, the ulama and the awliya and the salihin have loved animals and have loved to treat creation gently. And uh, they build mosques with little holes and walls so that birds can nest in them mosque like that down the road from me when I lived in Istanbul and creation care is just part of what it is to be Muslim. So on the basis of this uh, we have in Cambridge decided to represent this tradition in the new mosque which we're building. I'll give you a practical example of what we can do about this today where we can go on long hikes and we can be amazed by the mountains and South Africa you've got a bigger environment we have in England from Cape Town to Kruger National Park, we don't have anything like that, but still, you can walk around near my house, and it's <laughs> good, for the, good for the soul. Here you really see the Jalal, the majesty of creation, you're fortunate to find Ni'mah on the country. And engaging with the natural environment, which is more or less explicitly fought by modernity. Modernity arose in order to uh, harness the powers of nature to serve the interests of man, which in an atheistic culture means maximizing utility, pleasure, more gadgets, more fast trains, more stuff. 
and we all know what consequences that has for the environment, the capital E, because you dig up all of this stuff from the ground, not mentioning any names or places, but I saw some very strange looking hills as I drove in this morning from the airport. This is what Benny Adam does. Dig up the treasures, the kunals from, from God's earth, and then you make stuff, you make money out of that, and then you have to dig other holes to put the waste back in afterwards, the landfill. That's our activity. The major activity of Benny Adam now on earth is not praise, but it's making big holes and digging up, up stuff and then making other holes and filling it with other stuff. The only difference being that the original stuff didn't produce pollutants, but our stuff definitely does. Strange thing for a whole civilization to be doing. But in any case, amidst this catastrophe caused by human greed and a lack of reverence for the holiness of al muhit and the natural order, we have, as believers, to try and at least symbolically push back against this by being less wasteful, by using organic fabric, by eating healthy. These are all things that scholars are familiar with and are part of the Muslim way. Fasting, uh, a modest lifestyle, don't take too much of the world's resources. The average Bangladeshi consumes only one seventieth as much of the world's resources as the average American. And the gulf is getting bigger. So be with the, the humble and the poor as much as you can. But what we're doing in Cambridge, just to, to finish off uh, this little session, we need a new mosque. We've been rather slow. Other mosques, other towns in England have nice fancy mosques. We don't really. So we thought, well, let's use this opportunity to do something not just that keeps the Muslim congregation out of the rain. We have maybe six or seven thousand Muslims in the Cambridge area. It's not a huge community, but it's growing. Uh, but let's do something that symbolizes religion not tagging along behind an essentially secular environmentalist movement, uh, but actually leading it. Let's lead the way. Let's be maybe the UK's premier religious structure that cares about the environment and says this is the number one threat to humanity in the modern world. From a Sharia point of view, that's not problematic because it's the Qur'an. We are supposed to be the defenders of creation, the ones who walk lightly on the earth, the one who's found that communicated with animals. Not a problem. It should unite a community. So when we proposed the idea of an eco-mosque, we actually found that there, unusually, there couldn't really be objections from any section of the Muslim community. It's quite an achievement to find something on which there is no fitna at all. Some people think it's kind of weird, but it's not uh, an area of argument. So alhamdulillah, that was nice. And then we decided what should the eco-features of this mosque be. Now we discovered that, and Cambridge is one of the world centers for green technology innovation, uh, so quite an appropriate place to have an eco-mosque. We discovered that there are some technologies which are fantastically expensive, and which actually generate only a little of the green return, the carbon emission reductions uh, that, that you're looking for. And so, as in most things, and this is a Sharia principle, the golden mean, Khairul Omori al Satuha. So some of the really fancy technologies, ground source heat pumps and various kinds of reclaiming minerals and sewage and who knows what, we weren't going to do that. Very few people actually do that. It's a gimmick. But instead, there are some green technologies which actually turn out to be pioneered in many cases by Muslim scientists and technologists and companies. So a local Muslim business in Cambridge is donating to us the photovoltaic array that sits on the roof, which will generate 35 to 40% of our electricity requirements. And on downtime, should be able to even generate an income by uh, feeding back into the, the national grid. <coughs> So alhamdulillah, you have a local Muslim businessman who's donating this, uh, and it's fabricated in Pakistan, European Union specifications, and it's going to be on the roof. And uh, that was a sign of how the community kind of was coming together on this. We have air source heat pumps that just do recycling and warmth, and technologies called kuf, which I'm sure can't possibly be a word, but they say you've got warmth, you've got kuf, so you're going to get kuf in the summer. Right. So we're getting kuf from this recycling thing. Rainwater recycling. No shortage of that in Cambridge. Uh, you get months and months and months, gallons of it. Uh, and 
So we had to uh, figure out how to get that into the war areas without too much expensive fire purifications and so forth. An interesting third question such as water that has been used for a book, can you then use it to flush toilets? Mok just kind of scratched their head and said, you can't you can do that. So that's also a safety. So rainwater collection, uh, water recycling, and then at the end, um, any of the grey water gets distributed onto the garden, which we have a nice garden that uh, evokes the gardens of paradise that has some of the plants and fruits that are mentioned in the Holy Quran that surrounds, surrounds our masjid. Uh, the ventilation is passive. So the building is designed, as were many buildings in the traditional Islamic world before the ambiguous invention of air conditioning, to uh, capture air from the prevailing direction, to direct it passively through the structures and cavities of the building, and then gently to eject it at the other side. Uh, so during the Tarawish prayers, which in the summer, a uh, hot summer evening, even in Cambridge, is generally when a mosque's systems are most under stress. And it can actually be quite unpleasant because they can be really packed. We did worst case uh, scenario modelings of what it would be like if we had a thousand people in the mosque opening the various apertures that we have. And it turns out actually to be perfectly reasonable. We don't need air conditioning. Pundit enough, air conditioning monstrously wasteful of power. Uh, the southern states of America use 30% of their electricity consumption just from air conditioning. Gigantically wasteful. So, and under the we don't need to do that. So, uh, and the use of natural materials in the construction. Not getting fancy stuff from the other side of the world <coughs> uh, and causing more carbon emissions through the ships that have to bring it to us, but instead locally sourced materials uh, and Timber, which is the basis of the fabrication, is sourced from renewable uh, uh, forests, sustainably harvested forests in Scandinavia. And the fabrication is done in Switzerland, and it's assembled like a gigantic kind of cat pack thing in, in Cambridge. And the, of the, the structure is now essentially in place. So the idea is, when it's open, we will have, free of any additional charge, not just a place to keep the Muslims of Cambridge out of the rain, and place to get married and have a sandwich and uh, all of the rest of the usual functions of an Islamic center, but also a symbol of religion's participation in combating the world's number one threat, the melting of the ice caps, the death of the polar bears, all of the pollutants that are in the world's oceans. Everybody knows the story. It's uh, one of the most depressing stories around. Here is religion pushing back against that, not for utilitarian human survivalist reasons, but because it's a religious mandate. Religion is obliging you to care for creation. These are traditional Islamic practices. So the little holes that I saw in the wall of the uh, mosque, the Hayasma Jami, down the road from me in Istanbul when I lived there, let the birds nest in the mosque. We've got those as well in the Cambridge Mosque, high up, just high enough for larks to nest, because larks are now becoming endangered in southern England, so we'll be doing our bit for the, the ecosystem by allowing uh, birds to nest in the structure, and so on and so on. So great when school children come to visit the mosque, great when non-Muslims come to visit the mosque, because they'll see religion in action, practically benefiting not just one religious community, but all of humanity. Because the thing about the environment is that irrespective of your race, and gender, and point of view, and religion, it threatens us all equally. So this is what we're doing, and it's about half completed. So along with the Muslim College, which is my second headache in Cambridge at the moment, uh, we're trying to turn Cambridge into a symbol of Islam not looking backwards and endlessly fretting over the loss of the Golden Age, or looking forward to some fundamentalist misconceived utopia, but actually practically benefiting not just uh, the Ummah, but uh, all of humanity. So if you're in Cambridge, and you know, South Africans travel a lot, do stop by and visit our Eco Mosque opening in November next year. And it really is good to see not just Muslims but non Muslims really embracing the, the project. We've had dozens of donations for the masjid from non Muslims. And you can tell from the website, people leave comments here is my £10, pound. I'm an atheist, but this is beautiful and it's doing a bit for the environment. Uh, it's, it's good to see a mosque actually functioning as a symbol of, of being jammed up with what a mosque is supposed to be. That which universally brings people together rather than symbolizes one community's proud uh, 
difference and determination uh, not to uh, engage positively with neighbours. So that's my theory about the environment and then what we're actually trying to do about the environment in the relatively small scale local project of building a mosque in an English town. But maybe there's some ideas here that maybe you're ahead of us in South Africa and you're already incorporating some of these things. But it is nice to see how without much additional expense you can turn a mosque into a symbol that kind of represents the future for, for everybody, inshallah. So that's my little talk. Are we going to have Q&A now? Or what's the, the, the back end for the Bismillah? Shukran, Jazeera. Thanks very much to our esteemed Sheikh. Um, are there any questions that you have for Sheikh? Anybody would like to ask? Any questions? Yeah, just to repeat uh, the question, why is it, given that we have this mandate to, to engage in creation care and revere the environment, that there isn't more of this kind of activity amongst Muslims? Muslims should seem to be sufficiently aware of these issues. That's a good question. It has something to do with the backwardness of much of our religious leadership. Most of our footballs are to do with things that aren't immediately pressing issues for people's actual lives. Um, so we don't have many khutbas on how to eat healthy, for instance. I give one of those every year, and it's my most unpopular khutba. <laughs> Everybody looks really glum by the end of it, because I tell them what their health will be like if they reach 60, if they keep on with their um, uh, lack of exercise and their smoking and their high cholesterol, meaty diet and their industrial fizzy drinks. They don't like to hear that, but it has to be done. The ulama should be uh, giving us a like this. Uh, and the environment as well. I think most scholars, they're inhabiting some other place, and they really are not aware of the, the issues that are facing and threatening humanity today. Or they might adopt uh, a lazy, wrong theological position and say, Allah will always provide his risk, and it's not possible that the environment will break down. Well, I heard this from some ulama at the time of the Cold War. A nuclear war is impossible because that would be the Yom Al-Qiyam and Allah's business. We can't be human beings who do that, so we don't need to worry about nuclear proliferation. But that's the wrong kind of attitude, I think. The Holy Prophet, Ali Islam, was concerned with the affairs of the world and took the asbab. He showed that it is correct adept of the Creator to follow the rules of cause and effect, even though the Creator is omnipotent. Uh, well, unfortunately, some of our scholars now don't seem to recognize that a lot of Muslim countries are in the front line of climate change because uh, the areas that are most badly affected by desertification and rising temperatures and rising sea levels, they tend to be in Muslim spaces. So I have a friend who's doing a PhD in London at the moment, financed by the Bangladeshi government, doing research on the engineering required to put clay walls around Bangladesh's major cities because they're all going to turn into islands. Mm -hmm. But the average khatib in the mosque has got no idea about any of this climate change and is still talking about the traditional issues. His people may disappear underwater. <laughs> his family may drown in a generation, but he's still talking about how it's haram to listen to stringed instruments and shouting at people. Yeah, there's a place for that kind of thing, but there's an urgent issue as well. The planet is suffering because of human greed, and let's at least be aware of these issues. So unfortunately, it has a lot to do with, with the backwardness of the preachers and the honor Muslim discourses, unfortunately trapped in, in a lot of issues w which shouldn't be our principal concern, or a lot of stupid sectarian wranglings. What's the point of railways and deobandis smacking each other in Pakistan if there's going to be no bread on their tables next year because the crops are failing? Is that not a misunderstanding of religious priorities? Fiqh al-awadiyah, if you like. Environment is a big awadiyah. 
a big priority set of their needs. And nudge her all around and say, can you please talk about this? Because I want there to be oxygen in the atmosphere when my grandchildren grow up. Um, and if they're sincere, they should understand this and learn at least the basics of how to guide people to insulate their houses, maybe employ recycling techniques, not to eat so wastefully, not to use foods that contain a lot of additives and the wrapped in expensive wrapping, the usual kind of thing, not a very difficult thing to research. Unfortunately, our scholars are not yet doing that, which is odd. Um, actually, I had the pleasure of coming to your house uh, a few years ago, and I remember your wife um, taking away bread, <laughs> and there being no microwave, which is quite unusual for South Africans. So <laughs> I think it's like seeing the, the practical side of it. But my question is more around uh, this, this your new university, um, and just thinking about what's going on in South African universities. The South African universities are going through a kind of transition where we're talking about decolonization, transformation, we're talking about shifting the narrative, going back to um, other scholars. So this um, move away from the dominance of the Western paradigm of thinking. And I was just wondering how your new college um, might um, be providing alternative solutions to thinking to things like environmental health, but from an Islamic paradigm using scholars and thinkers and theories from our tradition. Yeah. Or In a country that has been uh, bruised and mangled by uh, unthinking external manipulation at the hands of European civilization, uh, it is entirely legitimate for the national project to be to try and figure out how the country can be healed by returning to what can legitimately be taken to be its deepest stratum of identity and, and values. We do the same thing in England. If the apartheid thing had happened in reverse in England, and say the Koreans had come and done what the, the Dutch and the English did in South Africa, we would also now, if the thing had come to an end, be engaging in the same kind of decolonialization rhetoric and trying to get back to what we truly are uh, and refuse to be defined by the categories and the philosophies and the religion of the oppressor. That's an entirely legitimate thing. It's not just a kind of piece of third world resentment and, and vengefulness. Uh, the only hesitation I guess one would add from a religious perspective is that it should be based not on revenge and on identity politics but on a sense that one can really find in indigenous literatures cultures and values, something that can serve as a genuine alternative culture in the context of a pluralistic modern functioning advanced nation state. If you can find that, then I would say go for it. There's no intrinsic legitimacy to Dutch or English literature and religion and stories here, given the rules that they broke and that our behavior for centuries here. They have no intrinsic legitimacy, they have to learn it. But if you're going to replace it with something else, Make sure that that something else is functional and is broad, tolerant, uh, profound, nuanced enough to be the basis of a civilization. Because running a modern multicultural society and a modern nation state is a difficult trick. Western civilization claims to just about do it, and the multiculturalism thing in Europe is now rocky, despite all the resources <coughs> that we have, the thinkers that we have. Um, other civilizations no doubt do have resources. <clears throat> but it has to be very carefully forged into a, a forgiving and pluralistic national uh, identity before it can really become politically active. Otherwise, the exercise becomes one of demolition rather than construction, which is never good for anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a saying or, or quotation that, that sticks to those that you cannot love God until you love God's creation. And then particularly people who put about the writing uh, books and articles. Oh, uh, well, most of what I write to Cambridge Academic is frightfully dull and read by a few Germans. <laughs> Maybe they're dogs, so I don't know anything about it. Um, a lot of these volumes are not often pulled up to the dusty shelves of university libraries. 
I'd publish something on the problem of evil for a volume earlier this year, something on the Second Vatican Council's, uh, for the history of the Second Vatican Council's changes in its views about the religions in the 1960s, a number of other academic things that happen to be bees in my bonnet. Um, on the more popular level, I've translated a few of the books by Imam Ghazali, uh, which, because Imam Ghazali is who he is, is and uh, the power, the radiance of his ideas, even after the nine centuries, have a certain currency uh, and are out there in the community. They get reprinted and uh, in the prisons, and uh, they, they, thanks to the imam, they are kind of penetrating uh, into wider society. So maybe that's the major impact of my my research. No translated a few uh, Turkish religious poems and songs recently, which have been published through this book. So, um, never ask academics about their publications. <laughs> it, 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 it puts everybody to sleep very <laughs> If we did really world-shattering things that the world would understand, we'd lose our jobs very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, uh, it, it's the same thing. If you love God, necessarily you love his works. If you love creation truly and you see the depth and the beauty and the symmetry of creation, if you have any spiritual insight and your inward spiritual circuits are not malfunctioning, you'll love the Creator inevitably. You might have a range of different names of conceptualization of that Creator because beyond conceptualizing ultimately nothing resembles him. <coughs> but still, the pondering of beauty and order in creation, the existence of constants in the material world, orderliness of its processes naturally lead one to love the, the Creator, which is why we find the tradition of sainthood in our religion is one that inexplicably connects the love of God with the love of human beings. It's a, uh, an outgoing, extroverted, uh, anthropocentric type of, of, of sainthood. It's always about feeding the poor, loving them, and the Holy Prophet, I think, Salaf Islam, is something who lived very much in amongst humanity. Rather than remaining in the cave on Hirat, he was with society because of his love of society, his desire to take them up with him. So, yeah, the two are inseparable. Um, what is the Uh, most of it's published by a UK company called Islamic Text Society. Islamic, Islamic Text Society. Actually, it was actually quite yeah, well, which, which is in Cambridge. They have a website. I don't remember the URL at the moment, but you should find them. Islamic Text Society. And they have a whole series, Ghazali series. Other translators have contributed as well. And I've also uh, launched a series of video lectures, um, which are available in various places on the internet. Usually at nursari.com, N U R S A R I, which is a Nursari traveling light because the series is called the Traveling Light series. Four of N U R S A R I. We actually recorded four of them in South Africa in, in Sheikh Siraj Hendricks' mosque in, in Cape Town. So you can see some familiar sights and faces maybe if you look at those four lectures. He gave some very brilliant talks. But there's uh, 34 of them available now which some people nowadays find more accessible than a 300-page book. Mm -hmm. My book on Pasadena's Remembrance of Death is not light reading, perhaps, <laughs> for, the, for the teenagers especially. But you can use a handheld device to download these online lectures. It's quite a handy format. For the new mosque, yes. that is something that has to be investigated, but there are certain uh, forms of organic detergent that are a little bit more expensive that can be employed, um, and low electricity consuming vacuum cleaners and floor polishers and so forth. Uh, we haven't opened the mosque yet, so that's next year's headache, I guess. But certainly in terms mm -hmm. of not just the construction of the building, but its ongoing management and maintenance, yes. we'll have to make sure that everything is environmentally Okay. So we'll be using that. Mm -hmm. 
spiritual selves, um, both in the physical space as well as you know, in terms of animals, um, like boiler chickens, for example, and the things that we consume and eat. And how do we pull ourselves out of this, the clutches of, you know, of I guess, um, the state we find ourselves in and how it is impacting our, our spiritual Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. I guess we all know on the surface the answer to it, if there's less of the natural world, it's less to reflect on, to the extent that our immediate environment the surrounds are technologically generated, they don't remind us of the divine totality and the divine ihata as much as things that are, as it were, experienced as the direct creations of God. Um, looking at a skyscraper is not as spiritually uplifting as looking at uh, you know, a lion, for instance. Every human being intuits the difference. Uh, we need to nonetheless maintain our, our lenses sharply polished because the world is still full of an abundance of stuff. Our Lord's hands are still full, the oceans still contain wonders, the deserts are full of majesty, the sky is still amazing. The essential form of it is still enough to indicate, even if the, the plenitude that one used to find. Um, has perhaps diminished somewhat. I walk along any English beach now, and whereas a generation ago, I remember as a child, you see shells everywhere and seaweed, now it's largely sterile. Mm. That's because the seas have been depleted by overfishing, by pollutants, by plastic bags, by all of the other things that we, humanity, blasphemously, if you like, throws in, into the water. So, you know, there's less indicativity, there's the, the ayat, not so easy which means that we might call pollution or environmental degradation, using our vocabulary, a kind of blasphemy, because it's veiling the divine and thwarting the divine purpose that we should intuit the sacred by immediately perceiving the wonder of creation. Uh, but we need to surround ourselves also with beautiful things in our homes, traditional artifacts, particularly those from Islamic civilization that recall the symmetry and the order of creation, things that are not flashy, but that are traditionally dyed, traditionally woven, traditionally created, they have a better effect on the heart. And you see that the great ulama always like to surround themselves with things that are simple, but have these patterns uh, that recall holiness and, and the creator. I thought not all Muslim men do that. My home is, well, uh, a bit messy in terms of the range of artifacts that are on, on display. But we should generally try to bring this, these ayat into the home house plants and using traditional textiles, traditional Islamic carpets and so forth. Because our civilization does have the art forms that the experience of being the most soothing to the spirit. If you go into any millionaire's house in Hampstead, in North London, for instance, you'll see that it's got Islamic ceramics on the mantelpiece, or we've got a Persian carpet on the floor. Um, there's so much from Islamic civilization that, that is there. People find it uh, soothing and, and, and beautiful, so we need to be maintaining that. It's not just about long hikes mm -hmm. in the mountains, it's about your home space as well. And of course, the design of the Masedi. Mm -hmm. so. <coughs> uh, Chef, um, I think the one, one question that kind of uh, intrigues us is uh, in the field of education, where we have a uh, kind of dichotomy <coughs> in terms of what is generally known as Islamic education and what is secular education. Uh, I wonder if you can, you know, from your experience and, and your forward vision of, of the college, uh, and how do you see the integration of this kind of knowledge? Is there such a thing as uh, a, a, a kind of distinction between what is Islamic knowledge and what is secular knowledge? I think that the assumption of our civilization historically was that more important than the building, the location, the administration, 
the curriculum, the number of books in the library is much more important than that, but the actual human quality of the teachers. Uh, so I would say that a school that purports to be dishonest, where the teachers are kind of lazy, don't think very much, uh, and are not good examples, uh, is actually less good a place for Muslim kids to study than a school where the teachers are very dynamic and get the kids to think, and uh, maybe even a normal school if it has a spiritual orientation can actually deliver better Muslim pupils than an Islamic school if it's badly run and the teachers have deliberately inspired the imagination of the, of the pupils. Um, it might seem counterintuitive, but I think the experience of Muslims who put their kids through schools in England often shows that that's the case that the kids who come from the Islamic schools are not necessarily good Muslims. But you find lots of good Muslims who come from ordinary schools, but those schools have high standards. Because if they're brought up to respect good values and to love beauty, then once they see Islam and they see the reality of that tradition, they can just be a natural concomitant for them to, to embrace it. Whereas if their experience as children of Islam has been that it's a little bit rough and the teacher has a stick and he doesn't really know very much about the outside world and uh, then they will connect Islam with that and they'll almost be inoculated against it. So a friend of mine runs an Islamic school in London, he used to be proud now. He had four children, but he didn't put his children through the school. <laughs> he put them through another school, one of the Rudolf Steiner schools in the neighborhood, which he took to be more spiritual and more uh, suited to developing the purity of the children's souls. It was an interesting indictment. There's a lot of money and resources going to Muslim schools, but they don't necessarily uh, well, the use of Islam in London is the same experience in the school. Not really evident to the case that you get a higher proportion of kids praying five times a day after you've been to a Muslim school than if they've been to a good non Muslim school. So it's complex. Any other questions? <coughs> yes, maybe just to share, um, it resonates with me in the education aspect on how to bring awareness to these things. Largely a society that's on a basic survival level and hasn't been brought up in those values of the environment. And it's, it's that sort of inability to perceive the environment for what it really is that calmness that a mountain would give or a tree for those simple elements. Because the mind is busy and the body is busy and it's in survival mode and possibly going down um, um, when we pause and we're able to just take in the environment then we can get natural appreciation of it. Um, so I think the, the thought is really on how do we sort of start practicing and bring together people according to those practices where there is the educational side and the experiential side possibly and as we're going to thoughts of experiential type of um, activities that would bring people or bridge the gap between this busy survival concern with not having enough food and not really having enough space in mm -hmm. mind or body or spirit to even go there. How could we look at bridging that gap? Well, helping young people to experience the natural world is something that is usually possible. You can arrange hikes for them, retreats, camps, and so forth in the countryside. And if it's properly directed, you can get them not to be running around playing silly games all the time, but to have some downtime and some contemplative time, uh, actually imbibing the mystery of uh, the mystique of nature. Uh, if they're staying in towns, one very effective thing to do is to revive that odd connection with the natural world which we have through music and singing, which in Islamic civilization is very much developed. Uh, phenomenon, particularly the, the singing traditions, that there is something here, there's something very primordial about singing, about generating harmonies, about matching meanings to sounds, that actually has a, a tremendously stilling effect on the heart, as well as mental and mental benefits. So I think that also needs to be promoted in Muslim communities, we need to get young people to sing more. The earlier generation of Islam, everybody knew hundreds of songs, but that's less common now for, again, reasons that um, but yeah, there's a basic uh, way of dealing with one of the mysteries of the world, which is the opposite of intervals, harmonies, that kind of 
Pythagorean symmetry that exists in the, the, the notes of the scale, there's a very strong indication of the order of the cosmos in that. It doesn't actually cost anything, unlike putting them all on a bus and taking them out to country parks to look around. So we tried to do that with, with our students at other college in Cambridge. Many of them have never tried it before, even though it's one of the most primordial human activities. It's very therapeutic for our communities, especially those brought up in inner cities, aren't used to doing it. We're going to take the last question because we're almost at our time. So, gentlemen, thank you. Try to be brief. My name is Yunus. Thank you. As you're talking, I think we're going through a very similar parallel process in South Africa at the moment, and that is the issue of land. The issue of land. Right. Land ownership and agriculture. And in our case, the schism arrives at land when we have a, what has become known as the Native Land Act. Um, when black people were put, effectively put off their land and fed into a, a working class, etc. White people now say, well, they, they give black people land, but they don't stay on the land. Um, which obviously raises the question, it can't be genetic, why do white people stay on the land? And increasingly we come to a realization that there's a, in addition to taking away property, there's also a schism of a connectedness with land and belonging. And, and, and the sense of a covenant, which is socially constructed, it says if I put an honest plow into the ground, the land will yield its fruit. And, and at that connection, that intellectual connection has been broken. And that what is needed is a, 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 a reconstruction. And so taking on the comment about what can we do locally. I, I do think it is about reconnecting that, that identity uh, and connectedness and that cut, the cutting of it. And the idea that our children don't know the names of the birds that arrive in the garden yeah. is a problem. Uh, twice a year, the sun is exactly over the kava, which means that at that moment, every shadow point of a vertical object is pointing opposite to the Kibla. So our investors will pick up on that. The, the water crisis in Cape Town, we've been thinking about for the last 15 years. I'm not sure if the point you made, how many, how many times in the year this water has been discussed. So, so it seems to me as, so it's a socially constructed moment that has to be re engaged and we need to recommit to the yeah. I mean, I'm picking up two things in particular from that. There is one's ancestral spiritual tie to one's place, which is important, which is validated in Islam. The cultural wants of the minority man, love of one's native land is part of faith. The Holy Prophet, in his exile in Medina, longed to return to Mecca. This is a natural human holy instinct. Uh, the other question, I guess, is the engagement with the fertility of the land, which is another very healing thing that we can come across, maybe with a little bit of gardening, but in terms of making the land actually flourish and produce, uh, producing vegetables, producing fruits, which was what most human beings were doing around the world until a couple of centuries ago, which is a profoundly centering and therapeutic act. I think, again, picking up on your question, one thing we can do to, to heal these, these wounds is to encourage young people to do a little bit of farming, to have an allotment, even a window box, just to get that extraordinary sense of being part of the natural world, see the other things have a cycle of conception and growing, life and competition and death, the same as with the rest of us. So, yeah, um, helping young people to grow vegetables, to grow fruit trees is a really good idea. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما واجعل تفرقنا من بعض تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا يا مولانا بذنوبنا شقيا ولا محروما يا ارحم الراحمين ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار وادخلنا الجنه مع الابرار يا عزيز يا غفار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب صلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم واخر دعوانا ان الحمد لله رب العالمين